Calling All Cars, a copyrighted program created by the Rio Grande Oil Company. operated by police and fire departments. Cities and counties keep accurate cost records of these cars, and it is easy to tell which gasoline gives greater mileage. Emergency cars test gasolines over the same streets and roads that you travel on. So when we prove conclusively that more police and emergency cars use Rio Grande cracks than any other gasoline, we have definite proof that this same gasoline will also improve the performance of your car. You'll get greater speed because Rio Grande cracks has been chosen for the fastest cars on the highway. You'll get greater power, for the most powerful motors made are in the fire engines that use Rio Grande cracked gasoline. And you'll get more economical operation, because cost records of the many cities and counties using Rio Grande cracked prove that this gasoline gives more miles in every gallon. So Rio Grande backs up its bid for your business with facts, not merely claims. The same gasoline that powers more police and emergency equipment than any other brand will actually improve the performance of your car. Rio Grande's independent dealers in every neighborhood offer you the same cracked gasoline that emergency cars use. him for the long hours, the nights away from home, and the risks he run every day in his search for desperate lawbreakers. Your police officers are intensely, personally anxious to trace down every evidence of a crime, and their greatest reward is the satisfaction of writing solved on the records of a case on which they have worked. Tonight we are presenting the dramatization of a famous case in which the police had very slim and nebulous clues to work on. The case looked almost hopeless, but the men assigned to find the murderer of Barbara Mauger made it a matter of personal pride to bring the case to a successful conclusion. The story you will now hear reveals what is, to my mind, one of the finest examples of sincere detective work in the annals of the Los Angeles Police Department, the case of the three grooved bullets. Our story tonight opens in June of 1928, when pretty Barbara Mauger, a girl of 19, is chatting gaily in her apartment with Mrs. Roberts, her neighbor from across the hall. Oh, my dear, I'm so glad for you. And when do you expect you'll be married? Oh, pretty soon now. Well, Russell and I haven't set the date, but we're going to run off any time and... And when we come back, I'll be Mrs. Russell Burholm. How nice. And aren't you excited? Oh, terribly. I just can't wait. Oh, and Russell has a new car. And Sunday we're going out in the hills in a picnic. How nice. Oh, uh, pardon me a moment, Mrs. Roberts. Of course, my dear. Hello? Oh, hello, Russell. Yeah? Yeah, I have it in the desk. All right. Yeah, I'll look at it right now. Hold the wire. Oh, what's that? 
I'm guilty, frightened Mrs. Roberts. This dress rehearsal's done. She's loaded. Oh, let's see. Well, I can't make this out. Can you, Mrs. Roberts? Oh, don't think that at me. It's all right, really. Say, can you make out these numbers? I'm simply afraid of guns. What do you want with the numbers? The well, Russell wants them, so he can get bullets for us. Bullets? Yeah. He wants to do some target practicing when we go on a picnic Sunday. Now, what do these numbers look like to you? Well, I'll see. Oh, please, keep it pointed the other way. <laughs> there. <laughs> I'm sorry. Well, now, I'd say that looks like a three, doesn't it? Yes, that's right. Uh, and that's a two. Yeah. And a two and a zero. Thirty-two twenty. That sounds right, doesn't it? Well, I don't know. Well, I'll ask him. Hello, Russell? Is 3220 the number you want? Yeah. Well, that's what it is, all right. Yes, darling, all right. I'll look for you later. Goodbye. And Russell, I love you. My dear, get that gun out of the place as soon as you can. I tell you, I'm frightened of him. No good ever come of having a gun around the place. weekend in the canyon off Mulholland Drive, pretty Barbara Mulga is enjoying the warmth of a June afternoon with her sweetheart, Russell Burholm. On the horizon, white clouds dilute the friendly sun. Overhead, the sky is deep blue. A bird sings nearby. Barbara is completely happy, but for one thin shadow across her heart. But Russell, we, we can't wait much longer. Why not? Well, I... Oh, I've told everybody. Oh, my friends know we're going to be married. Now, listen, Barbara. I've been all over this before, and I don't want to listen to it again. Oh, but, Russell, you promised me you'd marry me, and, well, every time I bring it up, you, you stop me. Oh, don't you think you've hurt me enough, Russell? Gee, I haven't any pride left. Now, for Pete's sake, let her. Oh, but, Russell, now, you want I to want know to be I won't wife. marry you. Well, I'll tell you now. I won't marry you because I can. I've got a wife and kid back east. Oh. And I'm going back to them as soon as I can. If you want the truth, I'm sick and tired of you, Barbara. Oh, Russell. From now on, we're quit. Oh, Russell, why didn't you tell me? Now you know what you're going to do. But I love you, Russell. I love you. That was in June. For more than two months, no one apparently missed Barbara Morgan. At least her disappearance was not reported to the police. And then, on the afternoon of August 2nd, 1928, as Detective Lieutenant Frank B. Condaffer of the Homicide Squad is standing watch at the headquarters. Homicide Squad, Condaffer speaking. Hello, Condaffer. This is Ferguson over the fire department mountain patrol. Yeah? This is we just found a dead body in Chester Brighton at the bottom of Stone Castle. Yeah. Dead long? Yeah, pretty long. Young woman. Looks like murder to me. Okay, Bergendorf. I'll get planners from my partner and we'll be right out. A half hour later, Detectives Condaffer and Sanderson joined Bergendorf on Mulholland Drive. Hello, Bergendorf. Hello, Where's the body? Well, the body's down this gully away. Come on, follow me here. Well, boys, here we are. Yeah, who found it? We did. My name is Vernon Johnson, and this is my pal, Edgy Hitchcock. How did you happen to find it? Well, we was driving up this way, and we noticed some big buzzards circling over the bottom of the canyon. We went down to investigate. When we, when we saw what it was, we run back and reported it. Mm-hmm. Been dead some time. Frank, look here. What's that, Sanderson? A bullet hole in the temple. Has uh, any clothes been found around here? No, sir, not a shred. Well, then it can't be suicide. No, she could uh, hardly have wandered all the way here on clothes. That's what I figured. Looks like the body has been dragged down the hill here from the way that brush is flattened out. Yes, but it's... It's going to be hard to make an identification, nothing to go by, excepting that she's a blonde. Uh-oh. Say, wait a minute. Uh, what's that you just picked up? Hmm. May not be worth much, but we'll take them in. Four white beads. 
Anderson and Condapper return to headquarters, and for hours they pour over the files of the Missing Persons Bureau. But their search seems doomed to failure. Well, this looks pretty hopeless. Yeah, not a description here that I've seen that'll fit the body we found there. You still got the beads? Yeah, a lot of good they'll do. You find they're not large enough to take fingerprints from, and if they were, these prints would probably only be those of a girl. It looks like this is just another unexplained murder. Mm, sure does. Looking to me about, eh? Oh, nothing much. We're far ahead of when we started. We know that the body of a young blonde girl was found, apparently murdered near Mulholland Drive. Yeah. And that's all we know. A young blonde girl, is it? Uh, how old? Oh, I should say between 19 and 21. Wait a minute now, wait a minute. Seems to me I heard something about a young blonde girl being missing. You did? Where? Wait a minute now, wait a minute. Let me think. Oh, yes, I remember. My wife was telling me a friend of hers lived in the same flat building with a blonde girl, the name of Mrs. Barber, as I remember. Yeah, about, about a month ago, she went away suddenly, and... Uh, hey, uh, that sounds hot. What address was that? Just a minute now, and I'll call the wife and find out. <laughs> John Baffer and Sanderson visit the landlady of the flat building to which their friend directs them. So you see, lady, if you could give us a line on this Miss Barber, we might be, might help us a lot. Well, you're mistaken in the name. No one by the name of Miss Barber ever lived here. But there was a girl by the name of Barbara, Barbara Mauger, she was called. She suddenly went away. Her boyfriend called for her things. But his explanation didn't sound straight to me. Sounds like we're on the right track. Does it, that? Now, uh, tell us all you know about it, please. Well, to be truthful, I don't know much. But if you talk to Mrs. Roberts, she may be able to help you. She was pretty close with the girl. Where is she? Well, she lives across the hall from the apartment the Margaret girl had. Just go up the stairs and knock on the door on the left. Fine, thank you very much. Here we are. There's the name on the door, Mrs. Roberts. How do you do? Uh, we understand uh, that you were acquainted with Barbara Mauger, Mrs. Roberts. Yes, that's right. She lived across the hall from me. Thank you, Ralph. We're police officers, ma'am. Barbara Mauger's been missing, and we're trying to locate her. When did you see her last? Why... Why, that Sunday when she went off on a picnic with a sweetheart? Uh, what is his name? Why, Russell. Russell Bearholm. Uh, do you recognize these, lady? Oh, well, those are her beads. What's happened? Is she dead? Oh, I just knew something terrible would happen that morning she left with him. Oh, that poor child, what's happened to her? Tell me. Now, Miss Roberts, you can help us most by remaining quiet and answering our questions. Yes, sir, all right, I'll try. Only tell me, what happened to Barbara? We uh, found a body yesterday, ma'am, oh. out in Stone Canyon. She'd been shot. Oh! <laughs> oh, I just knew something awful would happen to me. I just had a premature addiction when I saw that gun. What gun? The gun that belonged to her sister's car. That's all. She had it here. What was she doing with a gun? Well, she said that Russell had left it with her one day, the day before she went on the picnic it was. I was in there with her when Russell called and asked her to leave him the number on it so we could buy some bullets. <laughs> I helped him to the number. <laughs> now, Mrs. Roberts, please, you must help us here. Now, how long did you know Barbara Morgan, Mrs. Roberts? Quite a while. I was nearly every day when she was across the hall. Did you know her sweetheart? I met him once when Barbara and I were running town. He was in front of the Metropolitan Theater. Did uh, he work there? That was my impression. And what did you say his name was? Bearholm. Russell Bearholm. Uh, how old was he? About 28, I should say. Well, several years older than Barbara, anyway. Did uh, Barbara seem to be happy? Well, not always. Sometimes when I'd visit her, I'd start to be crying. But she never admitted it. 
She was always excited about getting married. Oh, she was engaged to this bird home then. Oh, yes. Although I, I somehow had a suspicion he was still her along. I see. Now, Mrs. Roberts, if you will tell us the circumstance of the last time you saw Barbara. Well, it was on a Saturday afternoon in the latter part of June. She was looking forward to a picnic she and Russell were going on in, in that place where you found her. Stone Canyon? That's all right. Yeah, what else? Well, as I told you, he called and asked for the number on the gun. She gave him to him, and, and then she explained that he had borrowed it from a friend of his, and he wanted to try it out on the picnic. Now I know what that meant. Hmm. Can you think of anything else there, Robert? I can understand it all now. Russell came back at about six o'clock, and I asked him where Barbara was. He said, you said goodbye to Barbara, Mrs. Roberts. She left for the east this afternoon to visit her family. I asked him if that wasn't pretty sudden, and I was a little angry because, because he hadn't said goodbye to me. Hmm. Well, didn't it occur to you to report your suspicions to the police? Well, I never meddled in other people's affairs. His story seemed plausible enough. He said something about Barbara's having met an uncle of hers who took her back. After all, I, I didn't think it was my business to start an investigation. He could have gone away, as he said, you know. Yes, he could have. Now, Mrs. Roberts, have you any idea where this bear home works? Well, as I said, I, I was under the impression that he worked at the Metropolitan Theater. Barbara used to telephone him. Where? At the Metropolitan Theater? I don't know. It was a Metropolitan number. Uh, can you remember it? Let's see now. It had some fives in it. Let me think. It was Metropolitan 152. Yes. That's it, Metropolitan 1525. 1525. That's fine, Mrs. Roberts. You've been a big help to us. Now we'll see if we can trace down this Burholm fellow. Well, please call me if, if I can be of any more assistance. We will, indeed. <laughs> Detectives Condaffer and Sanderson drive immediately to the Metropolitan Theater. At the stage door, they ask for the stage manager. The stage goes on now. Yeah. Come on, let's get a look. I always get a kick out of being backstage. Oh, wait a minute. I got an idea. What's that? You better not let this guy know we're detectives. He might show a hand. Yeah, that's a good idea. We'll just act like we're friends of our home. Okay, but wait a minute. This must be the guy now. Do you want to see me? Yes, we're looking for a man by the name of Burholm. He, he works here. Burholm? Never heard of him. Well, you see, he works here. Not and... here, buddy. Oh. That's funny. Are you positive? Or couldn't he be one of the motion picture operators? Hey, listen. Don't you suppose I know my own employees? Yes, but... There's we're... nobody here by that name. Somebody's giving you a bum steer, that's all. Well, has anybody by that name worked here in the last couple of months? No, I tell you. I'm busy. I've got a show to put on. I can't stand here when I answer dumb questions. There's a sort of a guy, isn't he? Yeah. Well, we're out of the limb again. Let's look up this number Ms. Roberts gave us. Okay, there's a phone over here by the wall. Let's see now. J-C-L-M. Here we are. Metropolitan, Metropolitan Theater. What was that number? Uh, Metropolitan 1525. Hmm, that's not the number of the theater. It isn't. Hmm. Let me see. No, but look. It is the number of the engine room of the Metropolitan Building. Well, now, that's getting closer. Let's go down there right now. Are you the boss here? I'm the engineer. We're looking for Burholm. Oh, Russell Burholm. He's working here somewhere. I don't believe that name here. Well, let's take a look at the time book. Why? We're trying to locate Burholm. Where's your book? I can't let you look at them. We're police officers. Oh, well, that's different. Yeah, hand over the book there. Sure, sure. Here it is. Find anything, Frank? No, no Burholm listed here in the past six months. Say, hmm. he had a cooling system put in here a while back. Maybe a man worked on that crew. Maybe. What's the company? It was the Macintosh Engineering Company. You might see the foreman of the installation gang. They're putting in the system in the bar room that they built for now. Well, thanks. We'll go over there and talk to him. Gee, it looks 
more like a pipe yard than a ballroom. Yeah. Hey, there. Uh, yeah? There's Russell here. Russell? No, he's not working on this job. Oh, that's too bad. We're friends of his. We're leaving for San Diego this afternoon. We wanted to see him before we left. Well, you can catch him at the office. I know he's there today. Okay, thanks. We'll drop by the office. Someone to see you, Russell. Right this way, please. Huh? We're uh, awfully bare home. Come along with us. Yeah, I thought so. What do you mean? Yeah, I read in the papers about a body being found. Suppose you'd be looking me up. Then you killed her. Huh? I didn't kill anybody. I had an argument with my girlfriend and she left me. Is that any reason for you to think you'd be accused of murder? Well, I, I noticed the body was found out on Mulholland Drive and was out there I last saw it. Pretty uh, peculiar coincidence, don't you think? Oh, I don't know. Even if it is her they found, that doesn't prove I killed her. Somebody else must have done it. I'll warn you right now that anything you say may be used against you. At the same time, you're at liberty to clear yourself if you can. Uh, I guess I won't do any talking until I've seen an attorney. If you aren't guilty, you won't need an attorney. <laughs> by a police stenographer who makes surreptitious notes from the front seat of the police car, Condatter and Sanderson drive their home to the scene of the crime. They question him en route. Now, you say you had an argument with Barbara, and she got out of the car, and you left her there. What was the argument about? Uh, she was always asking me to marry her. I told her I wouldn't. Why? I couldn't. Why not? Because I'm already married. Oh, I see. Then you had a motive. Now, what do you mean, motive? I told you I didn't kill her. Where did you first meet her? In the department store in Philadelphia. They both worked there. What name did you go by when you worked in Philadelphia? Burholm? No. No, my own name. Russell Sinclair back. Oh, your real name isn't Burholm. No, I'd, I'd gotten into a little trouble for store, so I decided I'd use another name out here. Because I didn't want my wife to trace me then. And I'm sick of this place. I'm going back to my wife and kid. Maybe you are. Perhaps you won't mind telling us why you thought the body found in the canyon might be hers. Sure. Sure, I'll tell you. Sunday, I, I think it was the 24th of June, we started toward Stone Canyon for the picnic. Everything went slow until on the way out, she began to beg me to marry her. And I told her I wasn't ready to marry her. Anyway, we had a quarrel. Finally, she started crying. Got so mad, she made me stop the car. She wouldn't ride with me any further. I kidded her a little bit, but I just made her mad, and she got up and walked off. That's the last I saw. Why'd you leave her? Along here somewhere? I, I really couldn't say. She might be near here. Well, let's stop here anyhow. Get out, Burholm, or Beitzel, or whatever your name is. Now, you say you left Barbara and Margaret on the road along here. Yes, yeah, she, she said she'd get home all right. She said someone had come along and give her a lift. You haven't seen her since, and it's been over a month. That's right. Mm-hmm. Why didn't you report her disappearance to the police? Well, I, I was afraid I'd get into a jam. Just like I am now, see? Uh, come on down this way, Bicel. This is where we found her. What? Yeah, surprises you, doesn't it? Not where you left her at all. That was further up the hill. But you hadn't figured on Kyle dragging her body, had you? Oh, stop. I tell you, I didn't do it. Where's the gun you shot her with? You had one, and we're going to find it. Sure, I had a gun. Yeah. I brought her along for target shoot. Your aim must have been very good. What did you shoot at? Nothing in particular. A couple of birds, that's all. Yeah, what you really mean is you murdered her, stripped her body, and left it up the hill there. I did not. Where's the gun you used for target practice? My desk. I borrowed it from a friend. I thought I might buy it, but I decided not to. Naturally, having no further use for it. What did you do with her clothes and things you removed from her apartment? Well, I bundled them up and shipped them away. Where to? Well, I, I just sent them up to some town in Arizona. Phoenix, I believe. To uh, what name? I can't remember. 
Well, I put a Seattle return address in the package. So well, what was the idea of that? I thought I could get him back again if you ever came or wrote for him. Come on now, Bicycle. You must realize your story is pretty thin. We won't hold water at all. Uh, that's my story. Yes, and you're stuck with it. Uh, I haven't anything to worry about. Uh, you may have before you're through, young fellow. And Michael has much to worry about as the case against him now. Philadelphia police notified us of arrest. Inform Los Angeles that he is wanted in Eastern City for embezzlement. A taxi driver, recognizing his picture in the paper, tells police to are taking him to the lonely spot of the murder late one night. A check of a fictitious address to which Beitzel admits sending Barber's clothes results in the return of the package. Microscopic examination reveals some blonde hair on the clothing to be the same as the hair on the murdered girl's head. In September of 1928, Beitzel goes on trial for murder before Superior Judge Charles S. Burnell. As the trial drags through one hot September day after another, Beitzel maintains an elegant air of cool insouciance. Then, after the defense has been wound up, the prosecution introduces a surprise witness. Yeah, this is going to be a stint. It doesn't look bad. Hmm. Who's this guy they're calling up to the stand? I don't know. Let's listen. And what is your profession, Captain Crosman? I'm an expert on ballistics. Will you explain to the jurors what that means? Ballistics is the science of projectors. Good. Do you recognize this gun? Let me see. Yes, I examined that gun for Lieutenant Condotter of the police department. This is the gun you examined. The same gun which has been entered in testimony as belonging to the defendant? Yes. How do you know it is the same gun? Well, I recognize the serial number, but even if I didn't, I'd know it by the saw marks on the side. The barrel has been sawed off, apparently, to make possible the attachment of a maximum silence. I object, Your Honor, on the grounds that this has no bearing on the case. It has a direct bearing, Your Honor. If the counsel for the defense will permit me to proceed. Objection overruled. Proceed. I would like to admit as exhibits uh, two enlarged photographs. Turn them so the jury may see them, Bailey. Thank you. Now, Captain Crossman, uh, do you recognize these photographs? Yes. They are enlargements of photographs I made myself. And will you tell the court uh, what they depict? The one on the right shows the mouth of the barrel of this gun. The saw marks I referred to may be seen clearly. Your Honor, I object. Objection overruled. Uh, the other photograph shows three fired bullets. You will notice the grooves clearly shown along the sides of the slug. These grooves were cut by the saw mark on the barrel of the gun. Your Honor. This is a waste of the court's valuable time. Witness may proceed. The bullets, you will notice, are marked identically. The ones on the right and left were test shots made from this gun. The middle bullet was taken from the skull of Barbara Morgan. Nothing could save Bicefall after the unimpeachable testimony of the ballistics expert and the jury of five women and seven men found him guilty of murder in the first degree. On September 28, 1928, Judge Burnell sentenced Beitzel to hang by the neck until dead. And on August 2, 1929, Russell St. Clair Beitzel paid his ultimate debt to society for his crime. Thank you, Chief Judge. Departments of the West are great boosters for Rio Brandy crack gasoline. The officers and sheriffs who drive police cars know that it develops greater speed and power in their engines, especially in emergencies when so many ordinary gasolines fail. The recommendations of these police officers and sheriffs have caused thousands of motorists to try Rio Brandy crack gasoline. With such satisfactory results that Rio Brandy is leading all gasoline companies in percentage of sales increase. You'll try Rio Brandy crack someday, and you'll be thrilled by your car's improved performance. But when you're trying and you're enjoying the greater power and speed created by a real brandy crack, be sure that your engine is protected. High speeds in hot weather thin out many motor oils so that they rupture and break down. That's why we urge everyone who drives to use Sinclair motor oil. Sinclair Pennsylvania and Opaline motor oils provide a guaranteed film of protection that never breaks down at any speed. Because all impurities, wax and petroleum jelly, are extracted from Sinclair motor oils, you can use a lighter grade, which makes your engine run smoother with less drag. 
to use less oil because the impurities that burn foam carbon are already extracted. Fill your tank case with Sinclair motor oil. Fill your tank case with Sinclair motor oil from refinery sealed tamper proof tents. Sold by all real candy dealers. When you drive in tomorrow, also ask for your free copy of the latest Calling All Cars News which illustrates the complete junior detective outfit that Rio Brandy is giving away free to all boys and girls. 